Olá, tudo bem? Graças Hello, how are you? Praise the Lord for one more episode of this tutorial of the daily food. We are in the series in the end will come. The title of this book is The Lord's Coming is at Hand. And we are in week three. The title is The Abominable of Desolation. Scripture reading, Matthew 24, 4 through 13. We'll be continuing the study on the Gospel of Matthew, a crucial book to understand the plan of God for man, for his life and for my life, for the Lord's government that he wants to establish on earth and the building of the body of Christ, the great commission that was given to our Lord Jesus Christ and therefore to us as well. This week we'll be covering a, a subject that may make us to be curious anxious or questioning the end times. That was a question that the disciples asked the Lord. When did these things he was saying? Maybe they were even scared about it, but when would that happen? The Lord not give them a specific date, but he gave them many uh, hints of what would happen in the end times for you and I to be watchful and to understand the moment that we're living in, the moment these things will happen. Especially this week, we'll be speaking about the abominable desolation. Who is this person? When the Bible speaks about him, which circumstance this will happen, okay? On Monday, we'll have a little bit of what we saw last week. We'll be we'll want to remind you that the Lord came to the people of Israel and they rejected him when the Lord closer to the end of the Gospel of Matthew, he went to the temple and entered Jerusalem. He found the temple, he saw a pitiful situa situation with fraud, corruption, leading astray the service that was holy, that should be holy service and pleasing to God, but that offended the Lord to make him to be angry. The Lord turned his back on this situation. The Lord abandoned the temple, which was supposed to be the house of God, where the name of God was. Lord had to depart from that circumstance, depart from the temple, and he went to the Mount of Olives. And he had a more personal conversation with the disciples about the things of the end. But before that, close to the temple, the disciples began to say to the Lord, Lord, look at the buildings of this temple, how beautiful they are. They're sumptuous, they're really relevant. Uh, with gold, with many details. And the Lord answered them, no stone will be left unturned. This caused an impact on the disciples. This caused in them, when will this happen? How come a structure like this, how this temple would then be put down? Then they asked this question to the Lord. But when these things would happen? There's a parallel on Monday still with a book. We'll see the book of Ezekiel, the visions he had about the temple. So at that time, at the time that Israel went to exile to Babylon, the Lord sh showed Ezekiel how corrupt the system of the service of the Lord was corrupted, how idolatry, the abomination, entered uh, the temple where that was supposed to be the place that God would meet man, God would dwell on the earth. This made God to abandon the temple. The temple was destroyed. We'll see that over this week. And his glory was no longer in the temple. It now went on to the Mount of Olives, which is exactly the place where the Lord Jesus have, had been for this episode in the temple. So here, there's a lesson for us, heads up for us. We, God wants to dwell with us. From an individual standpoint, God wants his glory to be upon us. But wallow. We have abomination while we have things that offend the Lord, idolatry. The Lord cannot be with us. So may we repent before the Lord to take that as a lesson for our lives as well. On Tuesday, the captivity of Babylon. So here, what is Babylon? The great problem that we saw here in regards to the temple. In Ezekiel's time, it is Babel, Babylon, the government, the laws of Babylon, the government of Babylon. What does that mean? This is a very important subject in the Bible. That's why it deserves our attention. 
What is the origin of Babylon? The origin is Babel. This is in Genesis. Genesis chapter 10 verse 10. It speaks about. Let us open it here quickly. In Genesis 10, 10, the principle of his kingdom was Babel. In this phrase, we see this term, the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, of whom? He's telling a story after the flood. So then you remember that the sons of Noah, Shem, Cam, Shem, and Japheth, defended Noah, disrespected Noah. You can read that Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Ham begot. Cush, so we'll see his descendants. It's in chapter 10, verse 8. Cush begot Nimrod. And he, according to the Bible, in verse 8, he began to be a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Before it is said, like Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. In the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. So, what apparently spoke that besides hunter, he was, he was mighty. This, maybe you think that this is positive, but the fact that this is not positive. After the flood, the post-flood generation feared God because of everything that happened, everything that passed on to them, what they saw, the witnesses, what the parents went through from generation to generation. It's your name, Rod, and name, Rod, was opposed to God wanted to have a government, a city, a structure of life totally independent from God, holding on and trusting on his own capacity. This is the origin of Babel. This is the origin of Babylon, to be independent from God. Maybe it's more than independence. It is even hatred with God's things. It's an attempt, a will of not living according to what God determined, not accepting the will of God in my life and in your life. So this is the principle of Babel which is very severe and causes a lot of damage to the people of God, especially. So, here on Tuesday, it still speaks that there are only two kingdoms. First, the church, the reality of the kingdom of heavens, where heavens govern. The Lord govern over your life. We heaven govern over your life and your family. In this kingdom, we do not live without God. On the contrary, we totally depend on Him he is the one who governs our life, and we can do say a prayer and say, Lord, govern my life. If there's something dependent from you, remove it. And the principle of Babylon. The provision for everything we need. And the second kingdom is Babel, Babylon. So it is the empire of darkness, the gates of Hades. The human being declares that he has no need of God. He can live with, without him. According to politics, this kingdom states that the state is layman, and there's nothing to do with God. And here we see a little bit of those who say they are atheists, who don't have independent of God, but they fully depend on nature and the thing that God created. So it's a counter sense. So then we see here, still on Tuesday, a little bit of the aspect of Babylon, the human government we see today. In the church, also we see the influence that Babylon may have over the centuries. The high peak of the influence of Babylon was high tower, then you can see that in Revelation 2. The Lord has restored in Sardis and Philadelphia, that is to be the desirable church, and the church in which Babylon has no influence, it doesn't enter the principles, the law, the rules of Babylon. This, of course, the, the inner aspect, of, the, the, and also the inner aspect of Babylon cannot enter in our lives. So anything that happens from it, any sign of independence from God, we have to reject it and treat it before the Lord. Praise the Lord, because we are in Philadelphia, in the condition of Philadelphia, which is pure, holy, living by the word of the Lord, and do not allow abominations to come into the church. Thank the Lord. Why? Because it is sanctified by the word of God, sanctifies us. We live according to the word. We love the word. This word is capable of cleansing us from all complication, sanctifying us and transforming us. On Wednesday still, there's a little bit of the continuation on the matter of Babylon. When it will be ended, Babylon will be ended with the 
great tribulation. So, see here that according to uh, Revelation, the battle of Armageddon, in the end there will be this battle. Then the book of Daniel and Revelation, we see the battle of Armageddon. Laws of Babel there will have an end exactly because the kingdom of the Lord, the kingdom of a thousand years, will begin right after the Great Tribulation. And also according to the book of Daniel, we are seeing this, that statue that refers exactly to the human governments over the centuries will be put down, will be reduced to dust, and through a stone, and this stone will be a great mountain, which is the kingdom of the Lord. So this is the end of the Babylonian government, with no doubt, we do not want to be in the principle of the Babylonian principle. This is a warning to the people of God, it's worth it today, as we see here, to restrict our flesh, not allowing that Babylonian elements to live in us, not even the church left. On the contrary, let us allow the word to cleanse us and to sanctify us. Well, this is the first part on Wednesday. It's still on Wednesday. There's the second part, which is from page 44. We'll be speaking about the time. The temple, the temple of the Lord, was a desire that King David had, oh, I dwell in good house. My God has no house to dwell, as if God needed a house. But David's heart, it is to be closer to God, to make God to dwell among his people, which at a certain extent, it is a principle still at the time of Moses with the tabernacle. God wants to be among the people, just as today he wants to be among us as well. And the kingdom and after the New Jerusalem forever will be with the Lord. So this is the heart of our God. He's not a distant God. He's need, needed. He wants to be near us. And then King David manifested this will to Prophet Nathan. Prophet Nathan said, okay, yes, but we're not asking the Lord. But when he went to ask the Lord, the prophet realized then that God did not want David to build a temple and that would be for his son Solomon. That David was uh, surrounded by many wars, bloodshed. That God appointed that it would be done by Solomon. And up until then, David decided to prepare materials for the building of the temple to make everything ready for King Solomon to work with the temple. What was this place designed and appointed by God for the temple to be erected? This is quite interesting because when we get many books in the Bible, many references, we notice here that this place, it is a place where it is referred after David committed a great sin against the Lord's census. He went to Excesses account the number of people who was with them. That was pride. He wanted to see how great his people were. And the disappointment of the Lord plague uh, was pervaded over the people. David was reproached by the Lord. And the Lord said, Do you want me to, to give you the hands of man or in my hands? He said, I want in your hands, Lord, because you are a merciful God. And then God, uh, with repentance, under the repentance of David, there was. Uh, consequences of this sin, but God gave a way of repentance for David, and he was he went and offered sacrifices in the place that he saw the Lord, expression of the Lord, and in that place he was consecrated and repented for the Lord. That place, it is the Araona or Orna. So David bought there in Araona or Orna, uh, the threshing floor of Araona, the Jebusite, or Orna, that was in that threshing floor that the Lord determined to build a temple. This place that we saw on Thursday, also it is Mount Moriah. Do you remember Mount Moriah? The episode of Abraham and Isaac, the Lord tested Abraham's faith and said to Abraham to sacrifice his only begotten son, Isaac. And that place was uh, Mount Mor Moriah. Of course, the Lord prevented that from happening, but the Lord proved, tested Abraham's faith. Abraham believed that even if Isaac would die, he would raise up. Praise the Lord. It's also Zion, the kinder thing. So the threshing floor of Orn and Orna, on Moriah or also Zion that we are seeing that was a strong part of the church. 
the overcome of stronghold of Zion where David also established there a place to defend his kingdom. So it is in that place that the temple was erected. On Thursday we speak about the three temples. Besides that, the three temples, the first one was erected by Solomon. And this temple was destroyed, plundered and destroyed at the time of Nebuchadnezzar, which is exile of the people. The people was then taken captive by Nebuchadnezzar to Babylon. They were exiled in Babylon. And there it was the structure of the temple, which was marvelous by the report in the Bible. Second temple already at the time of Ezra was rebuilt some point later under the lead of Zerubbabel. So King Cyrus in Persia let the people go to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple in the same place. It took them 22 years. There's an interesting point that after 70 years, around a million people, here's an estimate, were exiled, but as we see, those who returned to be committed to building the temple were only 50,000. So here there's a phrase that those who are fighting for the recovery of the kingdom are few people. Thank the Lord we are part of this minority. In, in picture, we returned with the river to rebuild the temple today. We are working on to restore the church from the degradation of Babylon, bringing them back to the condition of purity of the church of Philadelphia. This task, it's not easy, though. So praise the Lord that let us choose to be those who fight for the Lord's interest. This is a great encouragement. In this episode, in the second temple, the second temple, which is the ones in Ezra, led by Zerubbabel, was also destroyed afterwards. And then there was a king of Syria who was extremely violent, uh, wild, the story tells that he practiced horrible things in Tychus Epiphanes before Christ, and uh, he profaned the temple. This is important in the subject this week to explain to you. So he put a statue of Zeus, a pagan god, in the holy place, contaminating the house of the Lord. So he desecrated, defiled the temple. It would be an offense to Israel and the Lord. And there was a battle, a fight. Maccabees, Maccabeans took it back with Pompeius, destroyed the temple. They were not able to resist him. Once again, the temple was destroyed, so the second temple was also destroyed. The third temple, which is the temple that the disciples said to the Lord, how beautiful this is, how great this construction. This third temple, then, it's not the original or the second. This third one was built by Herod, who is, was not a Jewish person. He was a uh, Hydemian, uh, and he wanted to build it to please them. So this temple, which at the time of the Lord Jesus, repeating it, was destroyed. So the prophecy where the Lord said, no stone upon stone shall be left unturned. This happened. This happened with Titus, who was also terrible, killed millions of people in the people of Israel. They took over, uh, and there was no stone unturned because they had details of gold. They removed all the, the gold from the stones. That is why there's no uh, stone unturned except for the wall that Herod built. Part of the wall was around the temple. Today is the Wailing Wall, famous wall. And in the place where it's Mount Moriah, the threshing floor or of uh, Ornan or Arona, the Mount Zion, which is this place, all of these references refer to the same place. Today, what, what is there is the Dome of the Rock, the Dome of the Rock, which is a temple, a place of worship to the Muslims. There, according to the Bible, that should have happened the building of the temple in the last times, because the Bible tells us the sacrifice, the daily sacrifice in the temple will be, will be resumed in the end time. So somehow, 
the temple of the Jewish people, the temple established by God in the Bible, needs to be erected, rebuilt. Theoretically, according to what we interpret from the Bible, there's a place where it should, should be rebuilt. The problem is how to rebuild it if there's already construction in place, a sacred place for the, the Muslims at that place. Then we see the Antichrist. Before to be manifest as Antichrist, he will make on a covenant with the Jewish people, much likely uh, with the Muslims as well, who will allow this to happen. But after the temple is rebuilt, after three and a half years of this covenant, he will break this covenant. He will. Uh, he will. He will uh, desecrate the temple, defile the temple, putting a statue, a beast, and we will see a little more on Saturday. So this is what will happen. This is the physical context there about the temple that has everything to do with the end times as well. So on Friday, Father Peter helped us in a very educational way to understand chapter 24. We can split that in three sections. One section for the Jews, which is in verses 4 and 31, it has to be interpreted literally. Another section to the church, which is between verses 32 and 30, which is interpreted spiritually. The last section to the Gentiles, the nations, which is from verses 31 to 46, and also it is an interpret literal interpretation. So these here, the Lord reports many issues that after the disciples question many points many signs of the end times what will happen what is going to be like both for jews and gentiles and for the church so these three atmospheres are covered in matthew 24 but i'd like the emphasis here in this day it is a gospel of the kingdom even though the section of the jews the gospel of the kingdom we the church preaches it we we do preach it we're responsible to preach the gospel of the kingdom. So the, pointing that out, it is to live it. To, it's a real, it's a government. It's not just grace, but it is the gospel through which the Lord can govern over our lives, free from an independence coming from Babylon. So this is in verse 24, in 14, Matthew 24, 14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached to the end of the earth. This moment, the end will come. So, the importance that the gospel, the preaching of the gospel has in the end times. And then the end here that I told you in Matthew 24. It is related to the times that we would have this rupture, the break of this covenant in the last three and a half years. In the last seven years, in half of it, the, the course will break the alliance, will be manifested as Antichrist in a number of events. Catastrophes and events will happen in regards because of that situation. Uh, and then he will show up. On Saturday, then, we'll see what will happen. We saw that the temple will be erected, the daily sacrifice of the people of Israel will be restored. The people will begin to serve in the temple. The Antichrist will break this alliance, will desecrate the temple. What he will do, he will put his statue, a beast, within the temple. This beast will speak, will have a breath. So this will be given to Satan, this power to the Antichrist. To this beast, he will speak horrible things, abominations in regard to God. So on Saturday we see a little more on the abominable of the solution. What is abominable of the solution? In Greek, it means horrible desecration, defilement, profane. The, the abominable of the solution is the ways of translating the literal thing, the abominable thing, causing horror and disgust. It happened to King Cyrus, Dekas Epiphanius, put an image of Zeus. This will also happen to the Antichrist. It's interesting there in Revelation 3, we see the Antichrist seduces those who live on the earth because of the signs 
that he will perform for the beast say to those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast the, the one who survived and had breath to the image of the beast not only for the image to speak but also to to die all those that worship the image of the beast so the abominable of desolation mentioned here by the Lord in Matthew 24 it is the image of the Antichrist this is the image that somehow has breath and will profane the temple of God so there's power to speak and kill this is what we see here as abominable of desolation what is abominable? The abomination. Abomination it refers to idolatry. Desolation is the result, consequence of what he will do, which is collapse, the ruin, opposing to everything. You see a principle of that in our days. Anything that is God, anything that refers to the holy things, Satan goes against it. For him, it's an offense. So people also follow this principle. Today we can see that in the world, a little bit of the principle of the Antichrist. Well, it will be a moment full of calamities, terrible calamities. Here in the end, Saturday, we see that we need to be in peace in terms of, uh, we do not need to be afraid or anxious. No, we can and we must be prepared. The Bible gives us a way. Many of the things that are reported in Matthew 24 are for the Jews. In Israel, the people of Israel will be the epicenter of all this complication. Of course, this has an effect all over the world. But here we read that we must be prepared for tomorrow. With no fear of conducting our lives and our responsibilities. For the Lord knows all of those things. Besides that, those who are overcomers will not go through the great tribulation. For the more the end times comes, the more weird things happen also in, among Christians. And then it ends, yet let us not believe in them, let us believe in the prophetic word. This is a secret, to seek to be an overcomer, to seek the prophetic word. And finally then, after the great tribulation, of course, then again the Lord will preserve the overcomers, those who live in a pure and holy way, fully distant from Babylon. They will not participate in the great tribulation here on earth. They will be caught up in the air. So male child the first fruits they will not have the effects of the great tribulation this is what we we'll desire to be and in the end then of the great tribulation the lord will return will return to his own in his second coming it is a public coming before the coming to the overcomers is hidden perusia we call it the end of the great tribulation it is a public coming Matthew 24 27 says that uh, the Son of Man, then that uh, for his lightning comes from the east and it flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. This will be also in glory and power, no longer as the coming of the Lord was on the earth. He was a king, but humble and simple, but not here. Here he will be for judgment. It's a coming for judgment, not for grace, not for repentance. It's a coming now to establish his kingdom throne of judgment and the kingdom right, right after that power and glory peoples will mourn why because chapter 24 says that many will be more more will be will mourn because they will no longer live in babylon with the government with the government of god they'll see that they have no more future no more hope but they will mourn over that the final encouragement but I think that we have to take here on Sunday. We even think that it's easier to read it to you. These words are to show us at the end of times it's quite close and there's no time to lose. Let us not occupy very much with other things. Let us preach the gospel to lead people to salvation, to rescue them out, to care for them, to build up the church. The Lord is giving us so many tools. It's not just by chance. All this is for the church building. But the Lord will turn, will only return of the church is built up. Let us make our best to be part of the church services. Those who are already in any service must look for, uh, join others because in the church, it's not exclusive to anybody. 
When the last paragraph is quite precious, this reality of Philadelphia, this is the reality of those who will bring the Lord back, who will be preserved from this terrible moment for happen on earth, which is the great tribulation. So let us fight where the work is at the eleventh hour. The Lord put us in this context. It's not just by chance. The Lord has a purpose for all of us to work together here to build up the church. Far from the principles of Babel, Babel, the gov law of Babel, the government of Babel, only subject to the government of the Lord, dependent on the Lord. This is what he expects from us. Thank the Lord. May the Lord be with each one of you.